tomorrow we talk about clarity management, right? Because a lot of what I've had, NIF has always kind of been based on this notion of let's set up these approaches. Uh, there should be tensions within the approach. Like, okay, I like this part of the approach, but it has an inherent trade off. So there's tension within the approach. Then there's tensions across the approaches, right? It's so like I, I pointed that out with a kind of tension between three and two in a way, right? That we want it to be, we don't, we don't want them to spend so much money and to spend so much time in college, right? But we want them to take all these courses and, and all these, you know, values and all this kind of other stuff, right? So there, there's a tension kind of there. Um, so then the question becomes how do we react to those tensions? Uh, so I've been digging a little bit deeper, a little bit in my own research, and clarity management is one thing that came out of it. That's not my term, that's a term that's already out there. But when, once you once you recognize there's a tension between two things, right? Uh, there's lots of ways to react to that. Sometimes it's recognizing the tension and preferring one, right? Okay, we can't have both, and while they're both important, this is gonna be more important, so I'm willing to give up. Sometimes it might be kind of the Aristotelian ideal mean, right? Okay, we have the tension, we're gonna try to find that perfect balance in the middle somewhere, and then sometimes it's transcending the tension. Maybe that maybe it isn't kind of an oppositional tension. Maybe we can have both, right? Green energy is a good example, right? We've always kind of seen a tension between the economy and the environment. Well, green energy is that you know what? Actually, we can create jobs and, and all this kind of stuff in a green way, right? Um, so so steam is an example of instead of saying it's STEM versus everything else, right? It's like well, how can we kind of incorporate the arts and into kind of STEM in a way? Uh, or uh, you know, working with high school curriculums, uh, you know, there's a lot of you know. Uh, you know, we got to we, we want to focus on science and technology, but we don't give the other things. Well, a lot of the reading classes now they're focusing on reading, but they're reading about science, right? And it's that notion of transcending it. How do we kind of do two things at the same time in a way? Um, so that's that's part of that reaction in a way that because I know part of me when I focus on tensions, I do feel sometimes that I'm creating these false dichotomies, right? Um, you know, so that, that's part of what we're wanting to open it up. I think sometimes. Normally, we don't even have the dichotomy. Normally, we're only seeing kind of the good of my side and the bad of the other side. It's like a fake dichotomy, right? So at least what I'm trying to create is a fair dichotomy. Like, oh, there's an interesting tension there. And I don't want people to get stuck with the tension. I think, you know, recognize that there's lots of ways to react to that. That goes back to the wicked problems of a better conversation and spark innovation and creativity. You can spark interesting ways of kind of transcending that tension. There you go. All right. Um, but yeah, it was. It, and the other thing I'll talk about too is, um, you know, as a facilitator, as I was preparing for this, and my students were just doing this in class, so I was just teaching it. Uh, there's lots of things to talk about in each of these, right? Uh, in a 10, 15 minute, 20 minutes, they're not going to cover all of it, right? Uh, that's that's one of the usefulnesses of, of my model is you've got 15 tables, right? Across the 15 tables, you're going to cover everything, right? Um, for a facilitator, you're always dealing with kind of depth versus breadth, right? To what degree? There was always someone with a handout, right? Uh, I asked a few, which I'll talk about in a little bit, transition questions, but mainly I kind of let y'all kind of take it in your direction, right? Really. There was with the last one, I wanted, you know, I threw at that one kind of topic, right? Um, but you're not going to cover everything. You just kind of, you want to spend 15 minutes, you want to just focus on one aspect, you want to kind of move along a little bit, uh, but you also you have a broader conversation. You know, that's why I think this model works well when you have 15 conversations going on, because then you get the notes from all 15 conversations and you really get a sense of what people are saying, right? Um, but you can also, with a deliberative conversation, um, you know, you're not going to come to conclusions at the end. <laughs> Right. Um, so a lot of it, you know, that group might have some ideas, but a lot of it is you go to the data, you make sense of the data, and you go back. Uh, and, and that's one of the reasons I think that the, the model that I push in terms of universities playing this role, there are national firms that kind of do this work, and they'll kind of come in and run this meeting for your community. Um, but it's so hard for the meeting itself to be it, right? It's more the meeting sparks the conversation, which, you know, that does the cycle. So the more you have universities that are situated in that community long term, Right, the more this model kind of works of really kind of sparking that conversation kind of as we go. Right. Um, okay, so that's kind of a, a quick example. In, an actual NIA form is normally two or three hours long, right? So we kind of had an hour there just to kind of give you a sense of, of the kind of conversations, and particularly the sense of the role of the facilitator. Right? Um, you probably, in some ways, y'all are a really good audience. Right? Y'all are all pretty highly educated, <laughs> you know, so you're a really easy audience to facilitate in a sense. You all kind of inherently, you know, we talked about the need for balance. Plus, you you heard me talk for two hours this morning, right? <laughs> so I probably set the conversation a little bit in a sense. Uh, normally, when it's just the general public walking in, you're going to have a little bit more challenging um, in, in some ways, and, and I would have to intervene a lot more to spark conversation. You kind of did it on your own. I probably intervene a lot more than I normally would with this kind of group, just to give you examples of facilitator interventions, right, to, to set up what we'll be talking about now. Um, 
But maybe we'll take, since we're kind of after lunch, maybe we'll take a quick break here, yeah. right? just a quick little five, ten minute break in a sense, and then we'll jump back in and I'll start getting into the kind of facilitation theory of the specific moves. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Right. <laughs> They've come up with different options to address it. They've researched those. The engineers have told them the right one. The right one's been recommended to the, to, to the council. The council has to make a decision, and then they engage the public. <laughs> And, and the public can't do anything but complain. That's, I think that's one of the reasons so much of our public process is bad, is they only ask the public at the very end. And at the very end, once there's a specific solution that's been picked, there's winners and losers. And the losers are going to show it to complain. Right? Um, and, so this is a good story that I was told. When I, when I went through, I went through training by the, Amer the International Association of Public Participation, IAP2. Another great website, has a lot of good information on it. Uh, they talk a lot about the move from PR to P2 saying too often kind of communities or universities or cities are use public relations, they make the decision and then they're trying to engage the public in terms of selling them a message, right? Versus engaging the public for them to actually participate in the process, right? So they're saying we need to shift to that. And so that example of waiting until the end is an example from them. Uh, but they had a community that, that, that the landfill was filling up, right? So they engaged the community. Well, no, they, they found out the landfill, so then they, they go to city staff and say, you know what, you know, we need a new landfill. So city staff kind of research the landfill, research kind of the, the rate of trash being developed, researching the size, you know, figured out how big of a landfill that they needed to kind of cover the next 30 years, then looked at parcels of land in the town, um, and, you know, found like six or seven parcels that they could buy, and then evaluated the kind of that parcel and the wind and all this kind of stuff, and then identified one parcel as the best place to do it, and then announced it to the community that we're building a landfill right here. What do you think happened? <laughs> <laughs> Who showed up to that meeting saying, we don't like this idea? Right? Everyone that lived next to that landfill, all hell breaks loose, right? So they hire this guy, Doug Sorda, who was my trainer for IP2, to kind of come in and they started completely over, right? They said, you know what? Let's engage the community with, our landfill is almost filled. We need to do something, right? Uh, so they started with a problem in the community rather with a specific solution, right? Uh, so then the community engaged the problem. Part of engaging the problem is the community came up with some ideas that the experts didn't, right? They came up, for example, with the idea of what happens if we cut our trash significantly, right? What happens if we really invest, you know, this is 15, 20 years ago, and we really, really invest in a recycling program, right? So a lot less trash kind of goes there. They also researched that they didn't think about before, what happens if we just kind of bust the trash to the next town, which is a really big way to fill, right? They didn't end up going with that solution, but that was an idea that came up in the public that the experts didn't even think about, because again, they were kind of like, you know, right out landfill, we need a new landfill, right? Um, so then they went through the whole process, and they ended up having to have a landfill, it was a much smaller landfill, right? The community, this is kind of goes back to the adaptive change kind of thing, the community, since they're the ones that came up with the lower trash and the recycling, right, supported a big expense to kind of develop a recycling kind of thing, right? And also to kind of develop a really strong public campaign to reduce the amount of trash, Right, so their rate of trash. Now, if, this, if the experts had come up with that and just told the community, you need to throw stuff, that stuff away, it probably wouldn't have happened, right? But, but the community reacting to the problem, they came up with that idea, they took ownership of it, right? I don't remember the specific numbers of how much, but they had a significant reduction in the amount of trash, and they built up a new recycling program. Um, and then when they actually placed the, the, the actual new landfill, again, the people around that landfill were angry, right? But they were part of the process, they understood the need, right? The, the process was seen as legitimate, right? So, ah, I don't like that it's here, but they didn't, you know. Part, part of the item to example, in a sense, is this notion that we think we're a democracy, right? We think that a majority, especially a super majority, if 75% of people are, are, are support of something, then, then it will happen, right? But in reality, for big projects, for cities and for counties and universities, uh, one angry person that, especially if they're a lawyer, <laughs> they know what they're doing, can stop any big project, right? Mm -hmm. One of the main people I've studied with, uh, basically his dissertation was, what have major projects for cities to do, like a new road or a new, you know, whatever, new landfill, whatever, that the data was clear, the data showed it was necessary and important, but the public stopped it, right? Mm -hmm. um, and he said that the common, and I like, studied 20 different ones, it was all about the quality of communication, right? You know, yeah, it was always like one person or one group can stop something. Right? Um, and, and that's because we wait too long. Right? So that notion of what happens when we engage people from the beginning with a problem, and, and recognize it as a wicked problem. We're not going to solve this. We're not going to come up with a perfect solution. Right? There's going to be trade-offs no matter what. But how do we figure this out? Right? And you create that legitimacy, and then now you have a decision that's sustainable, those kind of things. And, and it sparked new things that people haven't thought of before. Mm -hmm.
All right, so to show you really quickly, this is in the little packet of, not your PowerPoint, but the other packet, which is some of the pages from my workbook. And we sent you the, whole, the link to my whole workbook if you want more of it. Um, but the first few pages, so like 46 and 47, 48, 49, those are just examples of the phrasings. Uh, page 46 has the link to NIF and public agenda, which are both have lots of different framings in this kind of model, right, of this, you know, here's the common problem with three approaches to it. Really, huh? Who did this uh, 46. Yeah. yeah, I think the first couple pages, uh, these are excerpts from the whole thing, so it's, it's obviously not the 46th page. Like mm -hmm. third, right? um, <laughs> but those are easy, ready made things that you can use in class pretty easily. Right? Um, and then we'll talk more tomorrow about uh, how I develop uh, the assignment for students to actually develop these their own, right? And kind of write these um, from scratch in a way. Uh, so the next couple pages show you some examples of that. And then I think it jumps, it, it gets to 53. So get to page 53. This is where we'll, we'll, we'll talk through this a little bit. This is kind of my facilitation training. Right? Um, and to contextualize this a little bit, when I was trained to facilitate um, 12 years ago, right, I was trained to be a minimalist facilitator, to do kind of we, we kind of call it the referee model, right? I, I, I keep time, and if someone breaks a rule, I, I blow a whistle. <laughs> but other than that, it's not about me, right? You just kind of, uh, and the, I think the thought behind that was, if you have good ground rules and a good environment and good material, and, and you know, and people in a circle, then it'll just kind of run itself, right? And, and that's kind of how we started the first couple of years. But then I recognized that the conversations we were having were not deep, right? Um, yes, we were in a circle, but people didn't really explore tensions. People didn't react to each other. Right? People showed up because they were fired up about the topic, So people, but it was still an individual collection of opinion. Right? We didn't really have. So then it slowly and surely after, uh, over the last nine years, I've been training facilitators to be more and more active because like, we're not doing the kind of things that people need to do. We're not working through the growth zone. Right? We're having this easy conversation. Right? Or maybe people will say, yeah, we need a balance between those two things. But then it was almost an easy balance. Right? So recognizing, okay, we're not at the extremes. We're in the middle, but it's just like this comfortable big, big middle. Right? Um, instead of saying, hey, we're on that balance. Like that one question I asked, hey, you're saying there's an imbalance. Are we too far? You know, we are trying to kind of we got to negotiate what that line is versus just saying it's a balance. Right? So we weren't doing the hard work. So I became more and more kind of focused on, on, on training that. The other thing, this list of 10 things, so you got the first five on this page, the next 10. Uh, I think about seven of them were on the original workbook that someone else gave me, right? I'm like, this is what a facilitator does. And we used to train this, we had to start with this facilitation training. But then the more and more we taught, we realized that these are 10 responsibilities for a facilitator, particularly a deliberate facilitator. Uh, I make a distinction between a facilitator trying to spark these kind of public conversations and a facilitator you hire for an organization. By definition, an organizational facilitator is hired by that organization to help them make a decision. They're in the service of that group, right? Whereas me, if I'm running this in the public, yes, in some ways I'm serving this group. I want you to have a better conversation, things like that. But more, I'm serving my community, right? I'm kind of using you to have a deep conversation about a broader issue. So I've kind of got split loyalties, right? That I'm not just wanting you to have an interesting conversation or have fun, you know. I'm wanting to kind of push you to really think deeper about this issue, right? Uh, so that's where the, the theory that I've been developing lately is this deliberative facilitator is a little bit different than a typical facilitator. To facilitate means to make easy, right? So normally I get hired by a company, that company says, we want to make you do this, and then I design a process to get you to that, right? Well, the delivery facilitator is different. My, my job is to make democracy work better. Um, you know, so, so that's where these come up with. So then we realized as I started teaching these 10 kind of responsibilities that it's easy to teach the responsibilities one at a time. You have to do all these 10 things. But then we recognize there's tension between these responsibilities. Right? And particularly, if you look at responsibility one, remains impartial. Remaining impartial is pretty easy if that's what you're focused on. Right? I don't, if I don't say anything, I'm impartial. Right? But anytime I do anything to fulfill the other nine responsibilities, I'm probably violating impartiality. Right? Or the same thing, the second responsibility allows the participants to own the process and topic as much as possible. Right? Anytime I'm doing anything else, uh, I'm probably violating that. Right? Because that approach, what I need to be doing is I want you to talk about what's important to you. Right? I want you to kind of drive the conversation in a sense. Right? But we found when we let people drive the conversation, they have this really easy service conversation. Right? Um, so a lot of the other later responsibilities violate that. So then the, the theory of teaching facilitation, deliberative facilitation, is really a, the art is balancing all these things. Right? You have all these things that you need to be doing, but there's not a right answer of the right one to do. Right? 
Uh, so it's become very much, there's a whole literature on the kind of, uh, of the self-reflective practitioner, right? And it's this notion that facilitation is very much art, not a science. I can't teach it on, this is how you should facilitate. It's like, these are the principles of facilitation. Um, and you're constantly kind of balancing. And it depends, A, on the purpose of the event, right? If the event's much more exploration, right, let's, let's learn how people talk about this issue, then y'all are driving primarily. I don't need to do something, right? If the purpose is we've been studying this for a couple of years, and there's this clear, you know, two or three tensions we're going to work through, I'm going to be very focused. I'm going to have you, I'm going to tell you what to talk about because I really want information on this, right? So the purpose of the event dictates it, the group dictates it, right? If you have a really good group that's facilitating or deliberating on their own, I don't need to do much, right? But if you have a group that's all thinking the same way, I've got to do a lot. I've got to play Delta Advocate, right? If I have a group that's really young, I'll tell you. So by the purpose and the group, kind of really dictates how you balance these things, right? Um, as we go through. So this is new. I mean, literally, hopefully, in the next two or three days, I'll finish this article and send it in. So if you're interested, I can send it to you when I'm done. Uh, I'll be working on it tonight in my hotel room. Um, but so I'll walk through these a little bit, and then I'll try to give examples of kind of what I did um, during the event to try to do these, right? So it remains in parcel about the subject of the forum. Uh, the biggest thing here is you never heard my opinion. Right? One, I let one little thing slip when, when I kind of made the cry. I forget one of the two of y'all were talking. I said, yeah, Americans aren't very good at that, right? Um, <laughs> that, that was one of them, probably, probably not appropriate, right? Uh, but generally, there's, and I've, I've done this topic a lot. I have lots of ideas, right? Um, but I never kind of, I never told a story. I never said what I thought was important, those type of things. That's the main thing about impartiality. I have to train my students, which is hard. I get really good students to apply for my program, right? And then I tell them, your opinion doesn't matter during the forum, right? Now, I've been smart, it took me eight years, but I finally figured out, because what I do with the notes, they used to just kind of turn all the notes to me, and I'd have to make sense of them, right? Then I started getting the type of the notes and send them to me, so it's a lot easier for me to kind of negotiate. Now what I do is I set up a Google Docs form, like a, a like survey monkey, essentially, that has questions in there, right? You know, what, you know, what advantages do people like about approach one? What does it mean? You know, so then they have to self-organize their notes into those boxes for me. So when I get all the notes, I have, you know, they're already kind of pre-organized. But then now when I do that, I also ask, so what's your opinion about approach one, right? Uh, they can't express it during the forum, right? But now that they've led this conversation and they're smart and they, you know, they, they, they know about tensions and so forth, so I'm able to kind of let them give their opinion, right? Which helps me as I'm understanding the issue and kind of thinking about moving forward. But during the event itself, their opinion is relevant. Right? Now, they can fudge that somewhat, because they can always play a devil's advocate. They can ask a question that directs, you know, if they think personally, people are not talking about equality, they can ask a question about equality and bring it up, you know. Uh, but they should do that for the sake of the conversation, not do that to get people to think like they want them to think, right? Yeah, so impartiality is, is you we know, already talked a lot about passion partiality, that we're balancing that. The second one, again, is, in some senses, I want people to control the conversation. One way I did that was my first question was always, what do you all think about this? Right? Obviously, the, the, the framework is already structuring something, so I'm asking you to respond to this, right? Uh, but I didn't, the first question wasn't. So one of the ideas here is to uh, you know, require internships. What do you all think about internships? Right? I didn't start with a specific question. I want to start with a very broad question. Later on, I might have some specific questions that come in. Right? but I'm trying to direct it. Most of my interventions were getting people to respond to each other and that kind of stuff. I've made very few interventions, which we'll, I'll call them the second transition questions, where I define the topic, that I wanted you to respond to something that, that I thought, right? Um, and part of that was because you're a really good group that knew about this, you know? So with this group, I didn't have to transition much. Often you have to transition a little bit more because the groups don't speak differently. Third, keeps track of the deliberation in terms of time and subject matter. This is a basic facilitation, you know, they're the timekeeper. Right? Um, but, you know, so you, you heard a few interventions, we got a couple minutes left here and that kind of stuff that I kind of told you where we were. Um, when I'm doing my projects, we go from small group to large group a lot. So we have the students at the table, but then they'll go up to me at the front to do a keypad thing or have a pres presentation and go back so my students have to kind of keep time uh, and, and, and chart. Just like the notes are your friend, time is your friend, or time limits are your friend in terms of cutting people off. I don't know if you cut anybody off here. None of y'all were long-winded, right? Um, it, which is actually amazing, because often when I'm training professors, professors, we tend to be long-winded, right? Um, but, you know, so you can often say, you know, we need to move on in about three minutes, so can you continue, you know, like, what do you want me to write down, that kind of stuff, so you kind of use, 
I tell my students, blame me. If you need to cut someone off because of time, say, oh, Dr. Parkinson's going to move on in a minute, so I need to make sure we get to this or whatever. Right? But part of your job, keeping on track of time and subject matter, right? uh, this is one of the harder skills of if someone is telling a story that seems to be a tangent, to what degree do you cut them off? One of the biggest tensions for our work are stories are powerful. The stories are so rich, but stories take a lot of time. <laughs> so to what degree do you let someone go? If you've got 15 minutes for an approach, someone tells a five minute story, that's a third of your time, right? Um, and, and, you know, so, so, and, and in the middle of the story, can you tell the facilitator whether that story is going to land somewhere important or this person just likes telling stories, right? Um, you know, so that, that transition, you know, and, and normally we wouldn't cut off a story, we never say a story is irrelevant. We might check, like, okay, we want to make sure, is that, you know, how, how does this pertain to this approach? Mm -hmm. And you normally either get, well, I'm getting there, I'm getting there, right? Or the person realizes that they're just trying to read the story that has nothing to do with this thing about wanted, you know. Um, uh, keeping it on track, but keeping something on track in terms of subject matter again is attention like, to what is to what degree am I dictating what the appropriate subject matter is or not, right? Um, so, so those tangents are always interesting cases. And that goes back to the self-reflective practitioner. What I'm able to do with my program is we do We'll prep for an event in class, and we'll, we'll have a specific kind of process design and facilitator guide. I'll kind of show you examples tomorrow if you want. Uh, and then we run the event, say on a Thursday night, and the next Tuesday in class we get debriefing. How did it go? Right? And in particular, what are situations? Right? So then those are always situations. Man, I had this person that started telling this, you know, and then we all talk about it. How can we react to that? What, what intervention did you do? What could have, you know? And that conversation between lots of facilitators is huge. And that's one of the reasons I think programs like Wendy and I are, are so valuable because we're, we're doing more of these public processes that require facilitation, but often the facilitators are just trained beforehand, right? You know, come show up an hour early, we'll train you to facilitate, but we get to have these students in class and, and debrief them, and I can require them to keep journals, and I can videotape them and watch them, you know? So by the time students leave our programs, they're pretty accomplished facilitators, right? They've got a lot of experience, but they also have a lot of time for self-reflection, right? And I think we're creating a skill set out there that's so valuable, right? So fourth, manages the group well and encourages everyone to join the conversation and ensure no one dominates. So again, a basic facilitation skill, make sure everyone talked, right? We actually had everyone talking here. I think you only talked once, right? But you did talk, right? You, you notice we had a couple of interventions that I made in the sense of maybe we could hear from someone who hasn't spoken before, right? There's a few times that two or three people raised their hand at the same time. I normally would pick the person who speak, spoke the less, the least, right? Um, to, to kind of talk first, kind of in a way, as you're making kind of some choices as we go, uh, but you want to kind of make room. We tend to never call on people. Like, I wouldn't say, you haven't talked yet, what do you think about this, right? <laughs> uh, I might open up space, you know, so that, you know, maybe you haven't heard from someone to talk about. Uh, I certainly kind of scan the room, you know, so if I saw someone who hasn't spoken much, trying to make eye contact or whatever, I would pay particularly attention to them. Someone who's talking a lot, I might, have, might not pay so much attention to them, right? Uh, you know, or I might just make eye contact almost to say, you haven't spoken yet, I've noticed that, you know? And that might kind of, you know, so there's like lots of little subtle things that you can do, but we tend not to call on people directly. Or if we call on them directly, we make it easy for them to say no, right? Like, you want to jump in here or not? No, are you okay? Okay, you know, we don't want to pressure anyone. Right? The other thing is if people are, if, if someone's dominating or something like that and other people can't get in, there's other, the basic challenge, and this is probably one of the biggest challenges facilitators say when I ask them, is how do you deal with the dominator? Uh, the basic uh, idea here is instead of trying to get that person to stop talking, get other people to talk. Right? Uh, it's a lot easier to get more people to talk versus to get someone to shut up, in a way. Um, uh, and and you know, getting someone to stop talking again, use the notes, right? I want to make sure we, we need to move on, but I want to make sure we get this. So, what are you saying, kind of thing, right? Or asking people to react. What do people think about that idea, right? Hopefully they won't respond to their own idea. Sometimes they do. <laughs> one professional, one facilitator that I really like, Betty Knight, who's been doing this work for 30 years, tells a story where she had a dominator, just every single question would talk, talk, talk. So she's like using all the tricks in the book. And, 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 and then finally she said, it was a man, she said, you know, what, what, what do you think a mother's perspective here? What would a mother say? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, guess what he did? If my mother was here, she would say, at that time, right? all your little strategies sometimes don't uh, But you do want, and that's why we have the ground rule, you know, that to, to be brief and those type of things. Uh, and, you know, just the process design of having small groups helps that, right? Um, to have a group of 20, NIF model kind of typically says, ah, oh, 15 to 20. It's like, that's such a big group. It's so hard, right, to, uh, 
the way we do subgroups, we can do as little as four. We have four participants, we're happy, right? But normally we have somewhere between four to eight, which seems to be the right number, right? Um, once you have 10 or 12, it's just so easy to hide in a sense. And it's not, probably the biggest, the biggest challenge we have more than 10 or 12, it's I want interaction. I want people to react to each other's idea, but when there's 12, there's so many people that want to talk. Right, that you mainly just have an individual question of opinion because you want everyone to talk. Right. Once you have a smaller group, then you can actually have a lot more interaction and go back and forth and you know and do those type of things. So fifth, models and encourages different <coughs> attitudes and skills. Primarily, this is about listening. Right. Uh, modeling a good listener. Modeling a good question. This is a really interesting thing. I, I do this with groups a lot with with high school kids and things like that. Like how many classes have you had in your education career? that focused on expression, whether written expression or verbal expression. Right? Tons, right? Probably one or two a semester your whole life. Right? How many classes have you taken that have focused on listening? Now, communication majors sometimes raise their hand. <laughs> I took universal communication, there was a chapter on listening, you know, that kind of stuff, right? Uh, or if you've taken conflict classes, there's in, you know, empathic listening, so, but very few, right? How many, how many classes have you taken on how to ask good questions? Asking good questions is a huge skill, and we never teach it, right? I mean, maybe one little component of a class somewhere, right? But the notion of how to ask good questions is just critical to inquiry, and critical to community, and critical to democracy, and, and it's just not as not a subject we teach, right? Uh, so that's a lot of what the facilitator is doing, and I mentioned this earlier, uh, where you really see an event after an event that if we do a three approaches in IF thing, the first approach that facilitator is asking all these questions and doing all these things, by the third approach, people are doing it to each other. But they're asking each other questions, right? They're doing perspective taking on their own, right? Uh, they're asking each other these reaction questions and probing questions we'll talk about in a little bit. Right? That's because you're modeling it. The tension there, there's one particular tension that comes up, is the main tenet of a good listener is eye contact, right? And invert, and, and nonverbal cues. Um, that sometimes can violate impartiality, right? You don't want to say, oh, yeah, yeah, I agree with that. That's great. That's really the. Because now you're saying, ooh, you like your ideas, right? You have to be very careful. As a facilitator, you want to say, ooh, that's a good idea. Right? You want to say thank you for your for your contribution or thanks for, you know, you can thank the behavior, but you don't want to evaluate the ideas. Because if you say, oh, that's a really good idea, then the next person speaks to you, okay? And you don't say good idea, then you're, you know, so impartiality. But the other thing is, if, if, you're, if you're speaking and I'm really eye contact listening to you, I'm missing the rest of the room, right? So as a facilitator, I need to know how people react. I need to know while you're talking, if Jerome rolls his eyes, I need to know, okay, he disagrees here. You know, do I make space for him to talk or no, you know? Uh, but how do you really kind of model really good listening skills without looking at somebody, right? Uh, so sometimes we talk about that beforehand, you know, you know as a facilitator, I'm gonna be kind of looking around the room, so, uh, but the main thing is we want people talking to each other. We don't want it to be, Participant to the facilitator, participant to the facilitator. So actually, I didn't do a very good job of this, right? That you know, our, our modeling here when we did the forum was mainly kind of a, most of y'all talking to me, right? Uh, and I think part of that's because we're spread out a little bit. We're not at a small table, right? So it was a little bit harder for me to kind of do that. And, and, and I was a very active facilitator because so I was trying to show you examples. So I probably did a little bit more than I normally would do. Um, but I would say, if you speak and then someone's responding to you, Ashley starts responding to that, right? What I would do is I would look back at you. And then actually, automatically, you want eye contact, right? I stop looking at you, so then you probably, and all of a sudden, you're talking to each other, right? Uh, so just like a very little thing, but, but if I make tiny eye contact, you're always looking at me, right? Um, so you want to set it up, and we normally do that with the role of facilitator, say, hey, now this is a conversation, you know, so don't feel you have to talk to me, or you don't have to raise your hand, like, we want this a conversation between you, right? as we go. So even that modeling took out attitude is complicated. So those first five are like basic facilitating responsibilities for all kinds of facilitation. Like as teachers, you all know this, right? Because those are a lot of things you're doing. The last five are getting much more into the deliberative aspects of facilitation. Right? Um, the sixth does not take an expert role in the subject matter. We always tell our students that you know, you're an expert on the process, but not on the content. Right? We need to, and often in class, if it's a complicated issue, we might spend two or three days in class. Right? They need to understand the, the, the acronyms. They need to understand the, the terms. Uh, they need to understand enough of the issue to be able to direct the issue. But at the same time, we don't want to be the experts in the issue. Uh, this is something truly that we're still struggling with to figure out. Uh, maybe Wendy knows how to do this, but it's the hardest question when, when, when I'm training a facilitator to say, if someone has misinformation, they're saying something I know is wrong, right? what, what do you do? I don't have a good answer to that right now. 
because when the facilitator says, actually, I think that statistic's wrong, right? I've now become an expert, not a facilitator, right? And I've also shut somebody down, right? But we also don't want that information to, to ruin the conversation, right? So we're always kind of, you know, if the misinformation, if it's in the, in the information, you know, if, if it's in the book, we can just refer. Actually, if you look to page three, that chart, you know, that's safer. But if I'm just recalling, well, actually, I took an economics class, and you're wrong. Now I'm a participant. Yeah. Out of curiosity, and kind of along the same lines, if there is a, a piece of information that everyone involved is looking for, some matter of this information, it's the information they're trying to find that you know, as a facilitator, are you in a position to contribute that? Because generally, unless something is you know, black and white factually accurate, any information you give is going to have your biases built into it. So yeah. what do you do in that situation? Yeah, no, and I think it's, it's about balancing these different things, right? So normally I would say, you don't want to do that, right? Uh, some of our events, we have roving experts, right? So we'll have some experts in the room that so they can call over. You know, so for example, if it's uh, if a policy issue, right? If someone's like, no, no, we, we passed a law last year, that thing's changed. No, I'm pretty sure it hasn't changed. You know, you can call over an expert and say, you know, what happened? Oh, yeah, last year. Uh, so it <coughs> clarifies it, right? Or I know like, when we did the school budget forms, we had the school finance officer in the room, right? So we can call him over. And he actually did a really good job. We coached him. I said, try to answer the factual question and get out of there as soon as possible, right? Because part of it, we don't want, we want the expert to make the decision for us. Right? If it's a tough decision, we're like, we, we'd rather the data be clear. Right? In some issues, the data is clear. Right? Uh, but most of the things that we deal with, the data is, you know, data is helpful, but doesn't make the answer. Uh, but, but you notice, as soon as there's an expert, everyone's like, I just told what to do. Yeah. Uh, so he did a good job of exiting. We've had other experts to help him process that didn't do a good job, that took over. Right? That told people, this is what you need to be talking about, those type of things. Um, but yeah, dealing with misinformation, I still don't have a good answer to that. I mean, it, typically it's, the downside of it is you change your role, right? So now you become the expert, you know, so then your, your, your impartiality might be kind of questioned in there in some ways. Um, uh, so then it's harder to have the rest of the conversation. Um, but if that one piece of misinformation really changes the conversation, sometimes it's worth it to say, you know what, to have a better conversation, we need to switch that away. There's other methods you can ask, you know, if someone is saying the misinformation, you can just ask them, so does anyone have a different view? You know, um, if there's a fact war, like one side has data, the other side has different data, you can sometimes play both sides. Well, let's assume now that this side's right. right? Well, why would that matter, right? And then after a while, flip. Okay, well, what if the other side's right, right? Sometimes you can just bracket it. It's interesting now with everyone with smartphones, right? So now if there's a factual issue, someone will start researching it, right? And trying to Google it and kind of find it in a way. Sometimes that actually can be useful, like with a change of law or those kind of things. Uh, uh, but we're still trying to figure out the right ways of really, again, dealing with that balance between data mattering, mattering too much and data not mattering enough, right? A lot of my NIF friends are like, it's all about values. Like, just talk about values and facts are irrelevant. And my background in argumentation is like, no, facts are important. Right? Uh, so we need to struggle with that. We're trying to provide a base of facts here, but additional facts will kind of come in. And people will always inherently try to avoid the tough work of negotiating values by just trying to kind of make it about facts. Um, so we're working on better ways of negotiating that. Um, health participants identify the values and underlying interests that motivate their perspectives. A lot of this goes back to conflict kind of management and moving from positions to interests and things like that, right? So people don't talk about values naturally. Mm -hmm. um, you know, people base decisions based on values, but they're kind of implicit and kind of hidden. So part of the job of the deliberative facilitator is to think about those values and to help bring them out. And a lot of that is through paraphrasing. Right, so when people say that they, they're really passionate about X, that you know, getting up here, why? Why is that important to you, right? Uh, to kind of get down to Because typically, once we talk about values, we all kind of agree that the values are important, right? We might disagree on the positions, on the specific ideas that we want to do, but the reasons why are generally pretty broad, right? Uh, so, so that's the level of thinking that facilitators, and we normally prep our facilitators, we'll do a process, okay, what are the underlying values here that we care about? Right? So then you, you're kind of going in thinking about these are the things that people are going to think are important. Right? Well, let's do that for a second. What, what are the values that were kind of underlining that conversation about higher ed? What are some of the things that people care about? You know, going back to like the water slide, right? the nine boxes. What are some of the boxes about higher ed? We value higher education as a, as a, as a, 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 a 
as, as something with work in which we all participate and something that we share with the society. Okay. So just higher education is value itself, kind of that um, broader thinking, kind of the, the whole person, the Renaissance, kind of, you know, that yeah. notion that we, that's what we're talking about, a broad education and a global citizen, you know, so, so we value that notion of people caring about lots of things and thinking about broader issues and the unexamined yeah. life and that kind of stuff, right? So that's, that's one of them. What else? Think about for the approach, so approach one. The utility? Uh, Utility, okay, yeah. So, so a competitive advantage, right? You know, approach one, which is interesting, doing approach one with a global audience, right? Because it, it's that notion of like the rest of the world's catching up, ah, yeah. You know? um, but, but there is that competitiveness, right? And, and a strong economy, right? So there's kind of value, and those are particular values in approach one, right? And, and approach two, you know, particular values of responsibility, kind of integrity, and, and community. Right, we're pretty important. Approach three is particularly kind of equality and, and compassion and, and fairness and justice, right? You know, so each each one, you kind of look, I think you actually have this page. If you, if you flip back to a page, yeah, this is page 51, I think. It kind of shows you the, the guts of an issue for them, mm -hmm. right? So this one was on healthcare, but notice kind of the, the second to last row of values, you know, that's for each approach, those are some of the key values we're really focused on, right? Um, and it's not that the other approaches are against those values, right? It's just each approach kind of focused on, has those values kind of higher up in a sense. Uh, so I spent a lot of time with my facilitators beforehand kind of thinking through, these are the kind of reasons, because we want to assume people are coming from a good place, right? Uh, so the first step is really getting a sense of all those kind of relevant values, and the next step goes to, to number eight, health participants, well, actually number nine, but we'll, let's jump eight for a second. Health participants identify and work through the key tensions within and between their perspectives. So once you have all those values, then deliberation is, you know what, those values don't fit together very well, right? Like we, we like this well-rounded, you know, student that kind of thinks about all these different perspectives and knows multiple languages and it takes philosophy, right? But we also want higher ed to, to not be so expensive and then not have to spend so much time and then have job skills, right? Uh, and in some ways those are attention, in some ways it might not be attention, right? I know with our field, this is the thing that my opinion that I wanted to share but I couldn't during the forum, is for communi we have communication studies major and then we have a journalism and technical communication major, right? Our major is much more liberal arts, right? You know, broad and the Greeks and Aristotle and you know, you know, philosophy of communication, how we talk to each other. Their major is much more pre-professional. We're gonna train you to be a PR person or to be a journalist or to write, you know. Uh, so people in their majors, I think have a lot easier job finding a first job, right? Because they have this direct job skill that they can sell. Our students struggle with selling their major, right? I think five, ten years afterwards, our students are in much better shape, right? Because our students have been taught how to think and how to, you know, have a much broader skill set, right? Uh, so I think ten years in, our students are in much better shape. But you know, so, so in terms of that tension we talked about earlier, Jerome, with that notion of, uh, you know, maybe these people skills, these other skills are job skills. They're just not as marketable as job skills. They're not as clear job skills, right? Uh, so that's kind of one way to think about that tension in a way. Right? Uh, yeah, so that, that approach number nine, and that, that's where I'm really kind of pushing a lot of our theory now, is how do we do that better, right? Um, how do we really get people to kind of just explore these tensions? And we'll do that some with the polarity management. And you notice a couple of questions I asked, I, I specifically highlighted attention, right? To kind of react to that, I put that on the table. Sometimes those tensions come out naturally, with someone saying one side, the other side pushing. Sometimes the facilitator kind of, one side gets expressed and the facilitator kind of pushes on the other side, and then sometimes that facilitator puts them out themselves, right? But all those moves, again, are violating the pure partiality and violate both one and two because I'm not telling you, you know, I'm not letting you talk about what you want to talk about, I'm saying you need to talk about attention. Jumping back to A, health participants develop mutual understanding and consider a broad range of views, particularly the drawbacks of their perspectives and benefits of opposing views. A lot of this work is to get people to think more critically. Um, our natural human impulse is to think of the advantages of our approach and the disadvantages of opposing approaches. That makes us feel very good about ourselves, right? Uh, so the purpose of the framing, the purpose of a conversation, the purpose of having a diverse audience, and the purpose of a facilitator is to get people to see the different sides, to play devil's advocate, right? So Thomas, Thomas, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, play devil's advocate himself, right? Which is great, so I didn't have to do that, right? But if I had a group that everyone was thinking the same, I try to kind of show that with the second approach. The first two people really liked the second approach, right? So then my next question was, you know, well, you know, so far we've really liked this. 
what concerns do you have as a pro? You know, so I'm trying to kind of push on that to have some kind of balance, right? I'm trying to give you yeah. One specific thing we talk about this is whenever we play devil's advocate, again, we're violating partiality, right? But you can play devil's advocate on different levels, right? So one level is for me to just kind of say, you know, not put words in people's mouth, but just say, you know, people that support this approach, what might they say, right? So I'm making y'all think about the other side, but I'm not, you know, forcing people to, right? Then, then a little deeper level is I might pick someone who has that approach. If there was a business person here, right? Um, what do you think they might say? So now I'm kind of invoking a voice. Sometimes if we do this process, we might actually put an empty chair in the middle of the room. Right? Uh, we can't do this normally because we just do it at tables, right? But if we had an event like this, and we would say at the beginning, it's like, at any point, you can put someone in the empty chair. Who's not here that should be here, right? It serves two purposes. One is people can actually do that, right? Say, I can imagine this person be here. It makes it easier to develop an advocate. But it also allows people to put their own opinion in the chair, but hide it, right? Uh, so, so you know, say everyone in the group is very progressive. You're more conservative. You don't feel comfortable expressing your conservative viewpoint because everyone else is going to judge you. You know, so you can say, well, I can imagine my friend if they were, you know. But it's just a safe way to express your opinion, right? So that's another just process thing to help people kind of see different sides, right? Even further, I can say instead of saying if a business person was here, what they say, I might say, I imagine if a business person was here, they would say, yeah, these are all great ideas, but these taxes are going to make it hard for me to hire people. How would you respond to that? Right. So now I'm not only I'm invoking a voice, but I'm giving that voice voice and making an argument. Again. I'm not making the argument. I'm saying, if someone made that argument, how would you react to that? Right. But again, putting you know, now I'm putting a voice in. So each of those violates the partiality a little bit more, but each of them is a move to help people really think about the tensions and think about other sides and those kind of things that might not be expressed. Right. So, so they enjoy that. Then the last one is kind of all catch all. Manage this out with a little bit of tensions. So, you know, find that balance between idealism and realism. One thing that came up a lot <coughs> is, is this tension between kind of principles and implementation. Right? It's a kind of debate terms that we use. Right? There's a lot of ideas that people say, we should do this, it makes so much sense. But then in reality, the, the implementation of it's hard. The example that really comes up, will probably come up this afternoon, is, is when we deal with childhood obesity issues and like that, is, is health class, right? People always say, we need to teach kids about nutrition and that kind of stuff, because we have such bad nutrition, right? Uh, but then I ask college students, how many of y'all took a health class, every single one of their hands, how many of those health classes were actually effective and useful? And I rarely, I mean, it's, it's probably like a 2%, right, where they thought it was a good class. So the idea of a health class is a great idea, the implementation of it, not so much. I might even push on, on foreign languages. The idea of having you know people being bilingual, I completely support. The idea that you can learn a language in a college course, ah, it's a little tougher, right? I mean, you need to immerse yourself in those type of things. You know, the degree of just kind of having one of your classes being, uh, you know, it, it takes several years, right? It, it's much more useful to kind of immerse yourself and go to that. You know, so so those, those tensions in a sense between implementation and that comes out. You push a little bit in terms of the political realities, right? So you support the idea, but you're saying political realities are not gonna let us do that, right? Uh, there, there's an interesting debate in my field of how much do we let political realities dictate the conversation, right? Some people will say, this should be irrelevant. Let's just have a conversation, figure out the right thing to do, and then, then don't worry about if it's hard to do, right? And for some people, that's a useless conversation, right? If there's not gonna be the money for it, or there's not gonna be the political you know, will to do it, then why talk about it? As you imagine, it's more in the middle, right? Sometimes it's useful just kind of having the vision conversation regardless of constraints, and sometimes we have to take on the constraints, right? So that's a negotiation that the, the, the group is always going to kind of do in a sense, right? That we don't, you, you, you tend to have someone in your group that's just the, 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 the negative Nancy, right? That just kind of, you know, who's everything? That's not going to work, that's not going to work, that's not going to work. And that's a very unproductive conversation, right? So sometimes you have to say, well, let's not worry about political realities. Let's just talk about, you know, and then maybe we come back around to that, right? Uh, complexity versus simplicity, I already talked about that, right? We're trying to get things not so complex, but also not so simple, so we're gonna negotiate in that middle. Depth versus breadth, you know, we had several topics in each approach that I would have wanted to talk about, uh, but if I talked about all of them, we would have spent a minute on each, right? Uh, so with your group, you're kind of deciding when do you, and that's a, a really specific decision for a facilitator. Do I ask another reaction question to dig deeper into that issue, or do I shift the conversation? Uh, and we'll talk about kind of practical things, right? 
So those were at least 10 things that, you know, so facilitator is very much wearing multiple hats. And, and all of us are teachers, I think, almost all. No, so we're, we're negotiating that already in lots of different senses. Um, as you think about this, I usually do this to actually train my students and train community people that are doing these events. Um, as professors, obviously, you know, hopefully you can kind of strengthen your facilitation skills as you think through this. But then part of the question is to what degree do we need to teach students these skills? Uh, just in our regular classes of having students facilitate, I mean, that playing that facilitation role is such a kind of different kind of role for students that help them really think about issues. Students are, have lots of opportunities in their life, in their academic career, to be an advocate, right? To make an argument for something. But to switch them into this impartial role and to switch them into a role that focusing on process, I think is a very useful kind of thing in a way. People seem very warm. Do we have any control of the things here? I can research that. Okay. I tend to always be warm. Mm -hmm. I grew up in Houston, so I'm used to being warm and sweaty, but I've been in Colorado for 10 years. So. All right, so let's look now to kind of real practical things. Page 57. Um, like I mentioned earlier, a lot of these broad deliberative processes that come to communities, they often will, will solicit volunteers to be facilitators, and then those volunteers will show up an hour early and they'll train volunteers in an hour to run the tables. Right? Um, this is another tension I have with my field because you know, Kettering, they, they want to be able to do that, right? They want to kind of, they, they don't want to have such a high bar for, for a facilitator uh, because they know most people don't. There's, there's few people that are willing to do that. Uh, I compare that to my experience the last 12 years of saying, it's hard to be a good facilitator. It, it's kind of, it's easy to learn the basics, but it's hard to be really good at them. But I think it's scary, uh, too. Mm -hmm. uh, I think yeah. it's scary sometimes for the students. Yeah. Like when I was training, I, it's not the same, but training students in mediation. Yeah. Like just the skill building of it, they were really, like, it's intimidating. Yeah, and it takes a lot of practice. Yeah. You can't just kind of, you know, read a book and go do it in a sense. You have to do it and talk about it. And, exactly. You know, talk to other people about it and, and, and do all these kind of debrief and so. Um, yeah, so I'm developing, you know, even just talking about those 10 responsibilities and negotiating tensions between them complicates it pretty significantly, mm -hmm. right? And I know there's some people in my field, you can't do that hard, right? Because if we professionalize this, then we're really closing it off. Um, but really, the way I react to that is that that's why every university needs a program like what you know, right? Yeah. Um, we need, I'm providing this capacity in my community that if every single college and university in the country, whether well, there's 7,000, I think, right, have this program, then, then the capacity of our community to have these conversations would elevate. And at the same time, students would be getting great skills. Right? Uh, my former deliberations didn't answer the phone in a time that they see on the phone. Yeah. So, to minimize, and what we're going to try to do here, we're too far behind, right? We're right here at 4, right? You said 4.30, but... 4.30, okay, good. Yeah, yeah. so we're good. Um, so we're going to do this little practice forum. I'm going to walk through these five choices, and I'm going to get three adult volunteer to facilitate, and then we'll kind of go back into facilitation mode. Um, this is just a one-page framing on childhood obesity, so you'll have to be one of facilitators, because this is one of your issues, I think. Um, <laughs> but we'll see who, who else wants to do it. So another kind of NIF simple framing. So you can start kind of looking at that a little bit. I, I purposely, when I do my training, we try to throw people in before they feel they're ready, right? <laughs> uh, particularly because I, I work with really smart students. You know, they are honor students that apply for my program and get to them. Uh, and they normally think this is going to be pretty easy, right? So the sooner I throw them in to try to facilitate, the more they realize, like, man, I'm doing 10 things at a time. So then they take the lectures and the discussion a little more seriously as they got to go through. Uh, but this page 57 is kind of the easy, kind of quick, here are five basic moves that, that basically facilitate. This, this is all encompassing. There's other moves, it's a little bit of a way, right? So if you get these five moves down, um, you're in pretty good shape. Uh, so you, before the five basic moves, the, the first thing that we normally do is a starting question. My starting question for every approach was a very broad one. What, hey, it's the first initial reaction. What do y'all think about this approach? Uh, you know, what do you like, what do you not like? I, I add the what do you like or not like just to frame it that that's the conversation we want to have is appreciations and concerns. Right, again, to kind of frame the notes. Uh, but then there's five other moves that we make. The first move is move on. You notice that almost every single time someone wanted to talk, right? Most times there was two or three hands up when I asked the question, and I kind of had to organize things. So I think the next, I think I could do the next page too, right? Yeah, 58. So 58 talks about stacking. What stacking is, y'all might already know this as, as professors, it's just the order of people talking. Right. So people raise their hands, I might have said, okay, we'll, we'll start here, and then we'll go here, and then we'll go to Ashley or whatever, right? Uh, we do the stacking because if you don't, 
people, if it's first one to talk wins, right? And everyone is focused on raising their hand and getting their attention or whatever. So by me acknowledging, or the same thing as someone was talking, if someone else raised their hand, I try to look at them, make eye contact, and kind of point to them, okay, I see you, right? So they can stop focusing on getting my attention and, and hopefully actually listen to the person already talking, right? Um, but this is another thing that we learned that yeah, people showed up because they care about the issue. They decided to spend their time, right? So when I asked the question, normally five, everyone wanted to talk, right? Uh, so say I asked the initial question, five people want to talk, uh, I let you talk first. You start, you know, you say something for two minutes, and, and but you both close your hands. So I call, uh, well, here, then here. And she says something really interesting, really, or provocative, or, or controversial, or whatever, right? But if I go to you next, right, you're not responding to her, because you raised your hand before she talked. Right? So we realized if we did, if we followed the stack, we would have an individual collection of opinion. We would not have interaction. We didn't have discussion. Right? So then we recognized that the stack is not the next person to speak. Right? The next person in line is almost like the next person to, to change the topic. Right? Um, so as a facilitator, if three people were in line, go oh, here, here, then Ashley, and then you spoke, when you finish speaking, I have a decision to make. Right? Do I go on to the next person? Or do we talk about what you talked about first? Right? Mm -hmm. We saw that from the very beginning, right? Um, I think Thomas was the first. I don't know, maybe, maybe we're good off. The, the question becomes, because right. so, yeah, you have this impulse, like, I want everyone to talk first, right? But then the first person says something that you know you want to dig deep into, right? Um, so what I would do is, if, if you said something you know, that's interesting enough that I wanted to spend some time on, I wanted to do depth versus breadth, right? Uh, I might say, okay, I know you're next, right? But let's stick with this for a bit, right? I might ask them different questions with that, and you'll see the different questions that we can ask. Right? That's one of the basic moves of facilitator, just because you have five people in line. Right? You want to honor the stack, so I normally would say, I know you're next, but, right? Um, uh, and then after we kind of go through, okay, so who, yeah, yeah, you, you want to you know, but again, it's that concept of the, the stack is the next person to kind of start a new thread of conversation versus the next person to speak. Right? Um, and one way to visualize this is, the notes, and, and again, we probably didn't get it. I didn't pay too much attention to those because again, there were too much behind me, right? Um, but what I want notes from this is like, here's a topic, here's four or five comments about the topic, here's another topic, and here's four or five, you know, instead of here's 20 comments, right? Uh, it's, it's the, the topic and four or five comments means people are interacting. Right? So move on is just pick the next person. That's most of your intervention, but that is complicated. Paraphrase. Paraphrasing is huge. I gave you a whole page on paraphrasing. I think I left that one right, page 60. Uh, paraphrasing is a critical skill for facilitators for lots of different reasons. If you look at page 60 for a second, uh, there's a lot of good things that you can do with paraphrasing, and there's some bad things you can do with paraphrasing. Whenever you're paraphrasing, you're really saying that I'm better at words than you are, right? So you want to be careful with that, right? One of my favorite professors that has helped us train is a great paraphraser, but she paraphrases everything, right? So after the 12th speaker, you're like going, okay, enough, right? Uh, but paraphrase, I mean, essentially note-taking is paraphrasing. Wendy was just constantly paraphrasing. She wasn't writing word for word what you said, right? She was capturing what you said, trying to use your words as much as possible, individual specific words, but summarizing it slower, right? Uh, but paraphrasing can be important. Uh, I don't tend to paraphrase that much. I probably did a few examples. So I'd say, what, uh, we train to paraphrase always as a question. Okay, what I'm hearing is this. Is that right? Always make it easier for someone to kind of correct your paraphrase or say, no, you got it wrong. Um, that moving from positions to interest and kind of talking about values, paraphrasing is a way to do that. So what I'm hearing is safety is a critical issue for you, right? What I'm hearing is the fact that things are unequal. You know, so you're, you're bringing out values and that that there's a power in paraphrasing that, especially when people disagree with each other, right? It's very hard for people that really disagree with each other to listen to that other person. But your paraphrase might all of a sudden like, oh, that's what they're saying, you know, and shift that conversation. So there's a lot of power in thinking paraphrase. We have our students do paraphrase practice. We make them watch city council meetings, so the, the one at a time with the microphone, and pause it between each person, say paraphrase. Right? And at home, they can do paraphrase practice, right? Or watch a debate, right? And after someone makes an argument, pause and say, how do you paraphrase? How would you pull the, the actual argument there? Sometimes the paraphrase is huge for the note taker. If the note taker is frozen, doesn't know what to write, right? For the facilitator to paraphrase. You can ask other participants, you can ask people to paraphrase themselves. So that intervention when people are talking too much to say, can you summarize? No, I want to make sure we get this in a note, right? You know, but can you summarize what you're saying in one sentence, right? You're asking them to paraphrase, right? Um, a great move for conflict, one of you teach says, if two people are going back and forth, but I like to say, can someone else help us here? What, what are we arguing about? 
What's the difference here? Right? Let someone else kind of paraphrase that. A gets them to stop talking, right? It gets someone else talking, right? Uh, but then it also changes the conflict. It gets everyone else to talk about that conflict, right? Instead of them knowing the conflict. Uh, so paraphrase is very powerful, but again, it's, it's also difficult. Well, paraphrase is also deals with, this is controversial in some ways, you can see. But part of the problem with deliberation is you're relying on people having a quality of being able to communicate well. And some people communicate better than others. Right? Some people are better communicators, some people are more educated. Uh, some people, English is their second language, it, it, sometimes it's not, right? You know, so sometimes the facilitator can play a critical role in equalizing things, that people that aren't as good at expressing themselves, the facilitator can hopefully, as a good listener, pull out their idea and paraphrase it, right? But at the same time, that's a power move, right? That's also kind of saying, gee, I'm, I'm better at this, you know? So we've got to be careful in that sense of using paraphrase too much to say that that I, I speak better than you, right? I'm a much better speaker. Uh, you know, <laughs> uh, you know but, but that, that's part of that process, right? So paraphrasing is a critical art. Jump back again to then the last three basic moves were types of questions, right? And I try to model these as we went through. So first is a probing question or a follow-up question. So a probing question is a question to the person that just spoke. Right. So I'm digging deeper. I'm getting them to explain a little bit more. Right. Very first thing Thomas talked about is I really like math classes. Right. I pushed you a little bit on that. And you notice I also it's called tracking. Right. Because you said two things. Well, I like the math classes, but I don't know if I like the the, the businesses being involved. Right. So I kind of split that and take them one at a time. Okay. Let's talk more first about math. Right. I, I asked probing question first. Right. Tell me why. Why is math important to you? Right. To kind of get that out a little bit. And then I asked a reaction question. What else do people think about that? Right? So probing the reaction on the next to it. So probing is asking that person to dig a little deeper. People tend to make lots of surface arguments. I really like approach two. <laughs> Tell me why you like approach two, right? Tell me why that's important to you, Why right? do you care about that, right? So you're following up in a sense to, to get them to talk about it. And then the reaction question is you're sticking with the topic, but you're getting other people to react. What do you think about that? Right? Before we move on, you notice one time Maria raised her hand in the middle of someone talking about what it was. Uh, I, I didn't know if she was reacting to that idea or just something else popped in her head, right? Uh, so I kind of asked, is this about this or something else? Right? And again, that's that controlling. Because the person just said something that was useful. I want to spend some time on it, right? Uh, but the new hand going up, you don't know, ooh, I want to react to that to the new. So you, you control that somewhere. Right? And then hopefully go back to Maria when, it, when you're ready to move on. Right? So the last question is a transition question. This is where you actually change the subject. This is where you as a facilitator, and we one of our techniques, you know, I, I told you earlier that these little one-page, two-page kind of handouts, we call them the placemat, right? So the technique, we call it punting to the placemat. Right? Uh, this, this is another way of negotiating the, the, the first and second responsibility. You want to be impartial, and you want to kind of then control the conversation, but as a facilitator, you know you're ready to switch. Right? We beat this idea to death. Right? We only got 20 minutes. We want to talk about you know, a few different aspects of this approach. Right? So the easiest way to do that without dictating is that look back at this approach. I didn't have to do this here because y'all were pretty varied and kind of jumped around. Right? But looking back at here, looking back at the examples, what haven't we talked about that we need to talk about? Right? I think uh, at least once I said trade-offs. Right? Yeah, and I pointed the place not by there. I'll look at these. What do y'all think about these trade-offs? Do y'all agree or disagree with any of those? Right? Uh, so that's where I'm not saying, look at trade-off number two. What do you all think about that? That's much more specific. I might do that, right? But the easiest way, the different levels of binary impartiality is, look back at here, what else do we need to talk about, right? Or I might pick one thing, what do we need to talk about, right? Uh, on those kind of things. So transition questions. Um, my, my students right now have picked topics for practice forums. There'll be two in practice forums on Tuesday. They've already been signed their, their issue book and their approach, and they're developing questions, right? So there's some questions you can develop beforehand. And I tell them each issue, each approach probably has four or five you know, pretty useful ideas to really explore. So kind of come up with questions for each of those. But then be ready not to use them, right? Because if the conversation flows pretty well, you might not need to, but you have in your pocket at least five transition questions to say, you know, what are the ideas here about this? What do you think about that? Right? And, and I particularly really like the transition questions that, that highlight tensions, right? There's a tension here, what do y'all think about? Yeah. Your move to the trade-off question was really good in the second approach, too, because there was a high-level consensus. Right. So then it kind of moved to... Mm. Yeah, so it's that same thing. If everyone agreed, everyone likes an approach, everyone doesn't like an approach, you tend to then say, well, you know, one of my favorite ideas, I mean, one of my favorite questions is always, you know, people that really would support this approach, what's important to them? Right. I mean, so that perspective-taking question. 
Uh, and it's funny because I normally get a funny answer first, right? Someone will kind of say, wow, man, because they're greedy, like, like, like money, you know, or they hate poor people or whatever. And then someone says, well, I guess they might care about, you know, and then it opens up this conversation and they realize when you're really pushing people that disagree with you, what's important to them, right? We don't tend to do that psychologically, right? We want the people that disagree with us to not have good values, right? We want them just to be evil, right? Uh, but then when we really think about, okay, well, what do they care about? How can I make a really good argument against what I believe, right? Is a, is a powerful kind of transition question or a powerful kind of perspective taking question, right? That they kind of set up, right? Um, so yeah, those are basically the five basic moves. You're either moving on, and that's often, there's hands up, so it's pretty easy to always just say next speaker, right? Um, you're paraphrasing from paraphrasing for a purpose, right? To help the notes, to help dig deeper, to open up the conversation, to, to help people understand each other. Uh, the best paraphrase is when you paraphrase and the person says, Yes, that's it. Right? <laughs> that's exactly what I mean, right? Then you feel like, hey, that's made a contribution. Right? Um, you're asking a probing question, which is a question to that person. You're asking a reaction question, which is getting everyone else to talk about that. Reaction questions are obviously critical for interaction. We don't ask enough reaction questions. You know, to get away from the one at a time in the microphone or the individual question of opinion, we need more reaction questions. Um, and then the transition question, obviously the transition question is the facilitator taking the most power. Right? I'm going to decide what we're talking about now. Right? So you got to be careful how you do that. And, uh, and you tend to kind of leave them pretty flexible. Thoughts, questions, pushback? You know, normally when we do these, when we do these in the public, right, um, the same facilitator does the whole thing, right? So, so you're, you're transitioning from approach one to approach two, and, and basically you, like I said before, it, your impulse is to summarize, and it's so yeah. hard to summarize well, right? Um, part of, you can rely on the notes here, right? You know, so you can, if, if you feel the need to summarize, you can say, now obviously we kind of capture all, all these notes as we go, that's, that's kind of summary. Um, if I've done a good job in the front of the room, people know what information we're capturing, what we're doing with that information, what the next step is. They know that within a week on our on our website will be the raw, you know, so a lot of that closure kind of stuff is there. Because um, yeah, it, it is difficult, like, like I said, with the, with the painter, the grow zone graphic, it yeah. says come to closure, yeah. but we tend not to do that. Yeah, because we're not making a decision, right? We're not we're not voting at the end. We're, we're using this group to really think through the issue but sometimes the groups are making decisions in some ways. Sometimes we use the key, you know, I guess there's closure at the individual table and there's a closure in the large group. Um, you know, when we talk about process design tomorrow, one of the things that we talk about is closure. Like, what do we do? Because I love the advantage of small groups. But whenever you have small groups, then you have everyone wanting to know what's happening with all the other groups. Um, I tend to be, I, I tend to hate report outs. Right? That notion of you have a big group, you know, in the deep table, someone stands up and says, yeah, we talked about this and this and that. I think those are painful and horrible, right? Um, a, because you can't do them well, right? Um, and, and B, especially if it's a controversial issue, who at the table does that, right? Uh, so we still do report out sometimes, but I tend to use the keypads. Um, uh, so, so we kind of do kind of at the end of it, you know, prioritize some ideas, get some sense of people have something. I tend to do, if we have public notes in some sense, I like to do worksheets that we can then post around the room. So we create a gallery walk. If people want to, they can walk around and see what other tables did. Or, yeah. So there are all these little mechanisms you can do to kind of give people a little bit of sense of closure. Almost always, when we're doing an event, it's a long-term event, we, we'd, like to, we, we'd like to already have the, the next date set. Even if the next date is just a report, like, you know, in three weeks, we'll have a report out if you're in, you know, so that people feel like, because we know the impulse to think this conversation is it was a great conversation, but now it's gone in the wind, right? Yeah. So what do we do to make people feel like this conversation has been captured, right? And there's people that are focused on understanding this. Uh, and, and another way we do this is most of our events are based on prior conversations, right? Whether it's a survey or those type of things. So we normally start our events saying, this is what we heard last time. Right. This is what we're doing. This time, because you know, so people went to the last event feel heard. Like, oh wow, they're actually reacting to what we talked about. And then also, hopefully, they take a little bit more, you know, mm -hmm. solace in the sense of, well, they listened to the people last time. So 
hopefully they'll be listening to us this time. Right? And, and that becomes a chilling effect. That, that's one of my concerns that people that do this work that don't that aren't situated there, that don't have a long-term view, is you can have a great conversation, but if you have a great conversation and nothing ever happens from it, it creates a chilling effect. And they're less likely to show up the next time and those type of things, right? Yeah. So yeah, so I, I took it a little broader than you're at, you know, but closures the yeah, table so has closure. I think it's the hard, like, hardest part, actually, yeah. maybe, because you have all of those ideas, yeah. and then choose yeah. something. Yeah. And, and yeah, I guess one other thing that we do for closure is we, we tend to have surveys, right? Um, oh. and, yeah, and, and we look, like, one of my favorite questions at the very end, and we normally do this as a round, um, is, okay, uh, you know, we've just had this two-hour conversation. Say we're doing something for the city council, we might have a question of what's the most important thing that you think the city council should know from this conversation, right? Uh, and we ask them to write it down. We'll say we'll type it up word for word, right? So then we always have this, con you know, so they've had this full conversation. They've seen the different sides of the issue, uh, and that's kind of another way to provide closure. People feel like, okay, here's, you know, I'm going to write this down, and, and this, these very words are going to go in front of the city council in some senses. So we'll collect all those. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of little kind of processing that we think about. I think too, yeah. like, it's also how you um, you communicate the, what the point of the deliberation is. So if you're yep. doing it in your classroom, we have tons of research, even, at, um, even on, on the events that we've done at UHD, that these events increase learning, increase understanding of other people, increase understanding of our own position, increase knowledge. So it, it can even be couched like if you're doing it in your classroom as just for the educational benefit. Yeah. You know? yeah doesn't always have to move to action, depending on what you're trying to do. Yeah. And there's, you know, some people have done, have taken a much more social scientific bent to this work. So you, we do have empirical work of, of like, to what degree has there been knowledge gains, and to what degree has there been a you know, significant movement of opinion, that kind of stuff that shows this work. Right? Yeah, that, that, that closure is kind of a tough thing. I mean, I tend to, like say when we do it in IF stuff, I really don't want to do a vote at the end in terms of which approach do you like the most, right? Because then that becomes the story, right? And we want to keep it at the arguments in a sense. <laughs> um, so that's why we try to kind of you know do these worksheets. Like when we were doing the river stuff, right? Um, we had people complete worksheets that were based on the NIF model. Because the, the river was, we had these four approaches of how do we deal with water. Um, you know, like we, we slow down growth, that we, uh, um, we, we increase water conservation efforts. Um, that we, we do more water storage, like build more reservoirs, or uh, we kind of take water from 85% of the water goes to agriculture now, right? So like the recognition that we can't have that much agriculture, we need to kind of spread the water around more, right? So we have these four approaches, and none of them magic bullets, all of them have trade-offs. Uh, and then we have these worksheets that at the end of each approach, we gave people like three minutes to write. Okay, from that approach, what did you like the most when, you know, it's interesting because it's a very polarized issue, right? So we knew some people really didn't want new storage, and some people really didn't want you know, agriculture to be affected at all in this kind of stuff. Some people really wanted, in our community in particular, there's a lot of no growthers, right? Let's not let anyone else in, right? Um, which isn't realistic, right? The only way to really stop people coming to your community is to make your community suck, right? And that kind of defeats the purpose, right? Um, but through the conversation, people filled in all the boxes. We thought people would fill in, like, these are the reasons why I like my approach, and these are the reasons I don't like another approach. But the fact that people admitted to flaws in their perspective and recognized advantages of their opposing perspective, I think, was huge. Right? But so we they filled out those worksheets, and after the fourth approach, uh, we picked up the worksheets and we had a few more questions at the table. But then, as there was still conversation, I along the wall kind of put these all up. We had all these um, you know easels, and we just taped up all, every single one of those worksheets, so that people can kind of get up at the end and look at everyone else's work. Right, and plus we told them. As soon as we leave here, I'm going back to my office, I'm scanning all of these. They'll be online by, by, by 10 o'clock tonight, right? The, the, the raw data from everybody, in a sense, right? Um, and that's kind of some of the transparency, so people really feel leaving, like, this matters. People are listening to this. Uh, you know, when, when people know that you know, the notes taken at the table are going to be typed up in part of the report, they know their specific word is going to be you know, live on, in a sense, right? Other questions? <laughs> A little bit, but uh, so do we want to? Do we have three volunteers to kind of model more facility? And what we'll do here is what is a typical exercise. You kind of have the sheet. You can do this exercise again if you want, or you can kind of do it in your class. Uh, the full exercise takes about 50 minutes or so. Uh, but you take one of the, and you can use other issues. 
Um, but uh, we do three approaches, and we do 10 minutes on, so 10 minutes of facilitation, and then eight minutes of debrief. Uh, so we do this with a new, this is, I figured out the last couple of years, one, one of the reasons why my program works so well. And I have 15 new students and at least 15 returning students. So I just did, after the first two weeks of class, we have an all-day workshop. So we have a nine-to-five workshop that we did last Saturday. Right? Um, and so the new students will went to training, but all the experienced students come back. Right? So I do what I just did, talk about facilitator responsibilities, basic moves, and then we do this exercise. But this exercise, we have you know, three new students in each, so one for each approach, and then typically at least one or two, sometimes three experienced students. So it's a small group. So they do the 10 minutes facilitation, and then they do eight minutes of debrief. Like, what questions did you ask, and how did that work, and that kind of thing. But what that also does, that I didn't realize after, until a few years ago, that I'm putting the senior associates, the second semester students, in the place of they're the experts, right? As I'm walking around hearing, they're repeating what I said in training and that kind of stuff, right? But then I think they, they take so much ownership of the program because of that, that I'm putting my trust in them of them training these new students, right? And you see the pride in it, so that this model of having this two semester, I don't know if you're able to do the two semester thing or not, you know? But the fact that I rely on my experienced students to train the new students, I think really builds up kind of pride in the work and the senior associates, right? Um, in a way that really kind of self-perpetuates itself um, as we go. So, do I have three volunteers? It, 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 let me couch it this way to make it a little bit easier. Um, we need you as a facilitator to make lots of mistakes because <laughs> mistakes is what really you learn from, right? Um, so if you're worried about making a mistake, that's exactly what I need, right? Uh, because I, I can tell students, no, don't play the expert role, but it's a lot easier to bring that lesson down when someone plays the expert role, and then we can kind of explain how that didn't work so well. Right. So don't, don't be worried about you know, doing badly, because we, we need you to do badly so we can all learn from it. Did that work? To, you know, yeah. Well, you call me if we do that. All right, all right. <laughs> <laughs> we got two, right? So one more. <laughs> Now the Americans are going to go for it. <laughs> <laughs> You're too engaged right, in the right. topic, is that what it is? I'm not even engaged on the topic because I don't think that any of the foundations have been. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so you want to be a participant, huh? <laughs> no, no. I, I'll, I'll facilitate if you want me to. Okay. I just I kind of am already kind of trained, so I feel like okay. it's maybe not the best for me to do it. Right. Well, no, but modeling good facilitation is always good. Okay. You know, it'll be interesting if you're training more in conflict resolution. Yeah, I'm, I'm so more trained in like mediation. Yeah, so it'll be interesting to see the difference. Yeah. Okay, y'all have a preference in terms of the approach. So the first approach, so let me set up the topic, right? So at least in the United States, this is probably generally international issue as well, right? But with obesity rates, if you look at kind of the last 30 years, increase in obesity rates. Uh, I know in Colorado, we, we're actually in really good shape in Colorado, literally and figuratively. Um, and I think we're fifth, you know, number one in terms of fitness, but even Colorado, the obesity rates compared to 30 years ago have skyrocketed, right? Uh, so generally it's kind of seen by a lot of people as an epidemic, like things have to change in a way. Uh, there's lots of information in terms of the, the impact on society, um, in, in terms of kind of public health costs and those type of things. And, and if you're obese as a child, you tend to be obese as an adult and all those type of things. And, and, uh, um, so. Generally, we've got to start, I think, from this, this common ground, like, hey, something's got to change, right? Then we, we can't kind of stay like this, right? So then the, uh, so we, this is the three approaches. I'd like to do these kind of approaches in some ways where each approach focuses on a specific stakeholder, right? That they should really take a lot more responsibility for this, right? This in particular kind of reinforces the notion I talked about earlier that you know, it's not about talking through and then picking one approach. We're not assuming only one of these entities. Could, now, clearly, all three have some responsibility here, right? But it's, it structures the conversation. What happens when we really focus in on what is the role of schools here? What is the role of government, right? And spend some dedicated time to think about that, right? Because one of the other aspects of, of the NIF model that I think works really well, with, with general issues, what tends to happen, especially like with legislature and policy, is one solution is brought up. Let's do this, right? Um, but if it's a wicked problem, that solution is going to have flaws, right? And as a society, we're really good at pointing out flaws, right? Uh, especially in an adversarial system, right? So we have a problem. We all agree it's a problem. People say, let's do this to solve the problem. 
that gets torn apart. Okay, never mind, right? Let's do this to solve the problem. That gets torn apart. Okay, never mind. Let's see. If, so, so we never do anything because we we're almost like waiting for the magic bullet. We're waiting for the solution that has no flaws when it doesn't exist, right? So what an NIF approach does is okay. Here's a common problem. Here's three broad solutions to it. Um, again, each one has flaws, right? But there's also that notion that since we're looking at three, and, and hopefully those three kind of cover a lot of the ground, right? Doesn't leave a huge kind of potential solution out that we recognize by the end of it, well, you know what? None of them are great, but we gotta do something, right? Um, so that it, it's able to kind of get past that hump of waiting for the magic bullet in a sense. That makes sense? Uh, so that's why this conference, you know, we're not making the argument that really only one of these entities should do, but let's let's spend some time talking through what happens if, if, if we really focus in on one of those entities, right? No, if we're doing this for real, you know, so we'd set up the problem, kind of establish, we don't have a video for this one or anything like that, establish, you know, how do these keep their, um, and then we're going we're gonna to spend, you know, about 10 minutes on each approach, um, facilitating, which is not long enough to really have a full conversation with it, but you know, we're just getting practice facilitating. Um, and then we'll spend some time kind of debriefing, talking about specific interventions, and I'll be trying to take, take some notes as we do that. Uh, so do we want to do approach one, approach two, approach three? Is that right? Or does someone have an approach that they'd like to do? Right, so what we would do, and I know you just got this, right? Um, we have a oh, here. We have our first code. Oh, yeah. I guess that's not the one. And I don't know if you want to just do it from there. If you want no, to, I think, yeah, why don't you go? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 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 I mean, some facilitators prefer to stand. There is some of these examples of conversations. Okay, okay. just so coming up with tension to figure out what to do with them. When you're right. standing, you know, uh, that's because you know, we're not doing the back end of it, right? If we did the back end of this after walking through these three approaches, that's when we would say, you know, okay, what, what can we do now? What do you think your school should be doing? Those type of things, or who needs to be doing what, or you know, some of the real key tensions that came out. That if we had more time, you know, we're, we're kind of spread, spread, uh, whatever. <laughs> I'm not thinking the words now. Um, but if I did, uh, you know, if, since I've done this conversation a lot, there's some key tensions in here that I want to get into a little bit more, right? Uh, that with the approaches, like for parents. It's always easy to say, parents need to be better, better parents, right? Uh, but parents don't like to be told how to parent, right? Um, and, and if you have a program for improving parenting, who shows up? The, the good parents, parents right? <laughs> uh, not the bad people. Yeah. So there's a, you know, there's a lot of issues that we're dealing with that the heart of the problem is parents are just not doing a good job. But getting parents to do a better job is not easy, right? So that's something we need to spend a lot more time on. And the stigma thing is a good example, right? And you kind of brought that back up in a sense, like, yeah. how do we... Uh, and I deal that a lot with, we, we, with poverty, and in particular with poverty, one of the biggest wicked problems challenging is single motherhood, right? Like the rates of single motherhood are increasing, right? Um, and in some ways, we don't want a stigma in, in single motherhood, and in some ways, we need a stigma, you know? And, you know, because it's very hard to kind of survive in a society. I mean, I've got three kids, and, and I'm happily married, and, and luckily my wife, we, we have the resources my wife to stay home right now, but the kid's little. I can't imagine someone doing that job by themselves, right? You know, but there's also that notion that we don't want to stigmatize, you know, we don't want to demonize single parents, that, you know, so it's kind of the same thing here, right? It's like, we don't want to demonize people that are homeless, right? Um, but then we also, like, in some ways we do. We, we want to say, no, we, we need to kind of eat better, we need to exercise more, and so, you know, so there's some tough tensions in there that, that require tough conversations. Uh, and it's really easy for those conversations to derail, right? I know that single mother conversation has derailed multiple times with people, right? That, like, how, how dare you say, well, no, I'm not saying, you know, I'm not making a moral judgment, I'm just saying, you know, if you look at the percentages uh, of, of who's in poverty, right, if it's a single parent, it's a really high percentage. There's very, it's actually a pretty low percentage of two parent families that are in, are in poverty, right? Um, you know, so that becomes an issue, but we don't know how to talk about that, right? Uh, so that's what you know. As you have these conversations, those things kind of come out that we recognize. Ooh, we want really, we, we want to really focus on healthy food. But man, when we do that, it doesn't work very well. Okay, how do we get innovative? How do we do that? You know, I know when we worked a lot with this issue uh, six years ago, we, we we went into schools. I talked to second graders, fifth graders, seventh graders, and tenth graders about the quality of food in the cafeteria. Right, and almost all of them said, "I love vegetables at home. Vegetables at school are horrible." Right, 
it's a big can of green beans yeah. and yucky water. It's like, you give us real vegetables, we'll eat them, right? But if our choice is gross green beans or pizza, I'm picking pizza, right? You know, uh, so it's really, <laughs> my favorite one of all was the second graders. It was actually in my basement because it was my, my daughter's girls' country. Uh, but we ran this forum. You know, we said, no, so should, should schools ban junk food? And one of them runs their hands. Yeah. Are nachos junk food? And I said, yes. She was, they said, no. <laughs> <laughs> she was a single issue voter. <laughs> she, she was the nacho lobby. <laughs> she needed to clarify. Right. Um, no, but, but we struggled, you know, and, and, and really, I mean, we argued, said, if we had good fruit, right, and it was free, would you eat it? Almost every single one would say yes, right? You know, so it was an accessibility kind of thing, and it was a quality kind of thing, right? You know, this kind of fruits, you know, mixed fruit kind of thing, you know, like, oh, that's gross, right? But you give me good fruit or good vegetable, I'm it, right? Um, you know, so, but, but you highlight, you know, from the conversations, you start highlighting the key tensions, and then you start really kind of digging deep. How do we do this? But most of our conversations make it very easy just to have the surface thing, right? Parents need a parent better, right? We should just teach parents. We should just ban junk food, you know? But then you start digging into it, that's, you know, and really recognize the tensions, you start actually having the real conversation you have. Yeah, third approach. Sure. <laughs> All right, hello. So I will be covering the third approach. The third approach looks at more of a government role, more of a policy role to this problem looking at um, implying taxes um, on uh, junk foods, more regulation, um, also doing more publicly funded parks and programs. Uh, uh, so just kind of opening this up now, <coughs> what do you all think about this approach? Well, I think that the government has a quite uh, important economic initiatives mm -hmm. to, to engage in the process. Uh, at first, it has resources to, mm -hmm. to, and uh, abilities, uh, and the second thing is that uh, the government uh, has to manage the, the, um, uh, the, the problem, the financial consequences of, mm -hmm. uh, of the city. So, uh, I think uh, the, the, the general answer should be that yes, mm -hmm. you have to. Uh, I expect the uh, government to engage. So overall, you're saying that you feel like there's economic incentive. Uh, Is that correct? Yes. Well, we may we may uh, divide it into two two uh, into the two areas. Areas. Yeah. First are uh, the costs which the government has to uh, spend on public health care, mm -hmm. and the second thing is uh, the possibility of using uh, market-based instruments, for example, uh, taxes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. Thank you for your contribution. Um, what do others think? Yes. I think that having the government take a stronger role makes a lot of sense because the one thing they have the resources to do that individuals and schools don't is market this as a real problem. If a parent tells their child one thing, you know, it's a family contained matter. Mm -hmm. If the school does something, there's going to be back and forth, but even then it's fairly contained. The government has the resources to market this as a broad issue with real broad consequences mm -hmm. that where you can see that even if somebody else is taking this action, in the long run it's going to impact you because if they are, say, in poverty and they're eating bad food, they're going to have health problems, which you as a taxpayer then end up with the bill for via Medicare and Medicaid. Mm -hmm. um, I think also that's particularly the government wants to take the approach of increasing regulation uh, when it comes to advertising junk food to children uh, because of just a single family or a school is going to have a real hard time convincing people that this is a potentially bad thing on par with, say, alcohol or cigarettes, mm -hmm. whereas the government has the resources to really kind of push that viewpoint. So I think it makes, strictly from a resource point of view, a lot of sense for the government to up the game on this one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. So what you're really saying is that you feel like they have the resources, they have the ability to make this a greater or broader issue and to use their resources in terms of taxation and regulation to further push that agenda. How do others feel about this issue? 
I agree, yeah, but I'm just curious, what, which government? I mean, the federal government mm -hmm. or the state government? Right, that's an important because question. It just varies so much from state to state. Yeah. I mean, I'm thinking of Herman Park, and I don't know how many people know that Herman Park is actually not a, a state-funded park, right? Interesting. It's a private park um, that is open to the public, but it's private. So, yeah. so, or that, you know, the other big part that I used to live by was donated by this really wealthy lady mm -hmm. to the state. Well, you raise a really great point, um, also in terms of regulation. So you can have federal regulation, state regulation, city regulation, like um, the ban of uh, large sodas in New York City, right? Which went over really well. Um, yeah, <laughs> exactly. So, so things like that. So I think Raquel brings up a really good point. So what do you all think about that? Where, where do we draw this line of regulation or is it gray? Well, I think we should we should use the subsidiary principle in, in, in this year. So, what what does it, I'm not used to federal uh, state, but but uh, those things which which should be solved better at federal level should be uh, solved. Uh, so I think the taxes can be can be such an issue. Whereas uh, I think the the management of of uh, landscape and parks and so on. I, 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 don't, I cannot imagine that the federal government mm -hmm. would do it. So you're thinking more federal taxation regulation and then more localized funding for things such as parks and, and uh, yeah, I think, I think municipalities? Yeah, for each level, uh, each type of government is uh, it, so, so one, one has to choose. Yeah, Wendy, did I see? No. No, I didn't hear anything. Oh, okay. <laughs> I was thinking like, <laughs> how great it would be if we could tax junk food. Then I was so wondering, you know, I was thinking about the McDonald's lobby, like how hard that would be. <laughs> right. I mean, we we, jump, we we tax alcohol, we tax tobacco. Mm -hmm. uh, in Colorado, we tax marijuana. Um, so you know, these sin taxes, right? And the idea of the sin tax is is it's a win-win, right? Either they 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 use less of the product because it's too expensive. Uh, but if they use the product, then we get additional taxes to do good things, right? So the idea of taxing junk food to subsidize healthy food, yeah. right? So the salad in McDonald's is as cheap as a double cheeseburger. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the problem is, for me, I know my, my parents owned a daycare center in Houston as I grew up in a pretty low-income part of town. So they had a lot of government programs. And every year she would go to a training about what kind of food they had to give to the kids. And she said every year the training changed, mm -hmm. right? So she'd come home and like, oh, milk's bad now. Can you have milk? You know, <laughs> next year, oh, no, no, milk's good. You know, you know so that, that line of what's junk food and what's not junk food. There's food um, lobbyists. When it's too. a political issue, right, yeah. you know. So to what degree, what do you say is junk food that gets taxed? Uh, to what degree do they add vitamin C to a potato chip so now they say it's healthy, you know. So I think the implementation of that's going to be a little bit more difficult than, you know, tax junk food and, um, you know, health, healthy food, right? What's junk and what's healthy you know, is going to be a politicized issue, but I'm not, not saying it's not worth trying to figure that out. What about some of these trade-offs? Are there any trade-offs on there that you are particularly drawn to or, or want to discuss? I think with the one issue we're dealing with with Fort Collins is is we have a new tax coming up, like an extension of a it's called the Building on Basics of, for like large programs. So they come up with a list of programs that we vote. So outside of the budget are new cool things, and one of them is a recreation center for the south part of town. Now at Fort Collins, north part is is a little poor. The south part is is a little bit more well off. Uh, north part already has some public recreation centers, right? Um, the south part does not, so we need a recreation center, but since there's not one, we have several businesses that are health clubs, right? Uh, so if they build a recreation center on the south part of town, it's probably going to cause some of those health clubs to close, mm -hmm. because now the government is providing a service that is the private industry, you know, so I can okay. see some of those tensions in a sense there. of, mm -hmm. if, if we're saying now it's a government responsibility to provide <laughs> places to exercise and, <laughs> and sports programs and leagues and stuff like that, and that means the private industry, you're taking that away from private industry. Right? Mm -hmm. So I think that that's going to be tough to see how that kind of plays out. For I think that's an interesting point you make, but um, also it adds choice, right? Yeah, but then uh, the, for the people who can pay for this sport program, so not really the people who are needing them. And there is a lot of people who, well, they just, I, I'm, I'm thinking that 
Moore Park with exercise equipment in a small neighborhood, especially neighborhood who are really low income. I think they, that should be also something that the government could help on doing that. Another thing also that I think the food desert also is an area that nobody speak and I mean I really didn't know much about food deserts until I started I went to USDA uh, on a fellowship and then I learned about this term and it's, I came back to Houston because we don't see food deserts uh, I mean but I, as when I look at the map I was really surprised how many food deserts we have here in the city so I think the that's a role also for the local stay and even the federal goal. Well, I agree with Maria. I, I was trying to move to a cheaper apartment. So then I don't remember which ward it is in Houston, but I, I just mapped it because I don't have a car. So I was like, where's the grocery store? There is a ward in Houston that has no grocery stores within its borders. Absolutely none. And I was like, I can't live there. I don't know how people live there. Um, so that's a food desert that we have, right, uh, in Houston. And then, but also I think, well, I don't, I don't know, I just, um, it's not only the, the parks for poor neighborhoods, but the safety. Like, are there, is it really safe for them to go outside? Do their parents feel safe for the children to be playing? Are there drug dealers? Are, are, there, are they going to be shot? Are they, so if you don't have that safety, um, then it's very hard for parents to say, oh, yeah, let me just send my child to the park. Others who have, we haven't heard from yet? About a, about a minute or so. Running on stage. <laughs> 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 I don't think it's happening. Okay. <laughs> 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 I felt fun. <laughs> she has a lot of experience kind of coming in, right? So, I, I mean, I noticed for sure, like, the, you know, most of us were liking this approach, right? So, one of the interventions yeah. you made is, you know, what do you think about those trade offs, right? Yeah. So, that was kind of a transition question and a push on that. Oh, and I think that's a good point. It's like once you do it a couple times, I think you feel a lot more comfortable than, like, completely stressed <laughs> out. Yeah. So, all three of y'all chose to stand, mm -hmm. right? I don't know if y'all have. The reason you made that choice, or a couple, I mean, y'all are used to being teachers, probably, yeah. so you're used to kind of standing in front of the room in a sense, right? Uh, do y'all do you normally if you do mediations? No, you know, what, what mediation is normally just between two me. people, right? Or, yeah, yeah, I'll like set up the table so everyone's kind of equal. Yeah. But so I I do kind of like deliver the style in my classes a lot. Okay. So that's why I felt more comfortable standing. Okay. Yeah. I kind of treated it like that. Yeah. It, the distinction between mediation and deliberation. I mean, I'd be curious yeah. if you have any kind of initial thoughts with that. I have some, but. I mean, do you see a difference between kind of a public kind of, you know, the public showing up and, and a mediation? Uh, at least in my mind, a mediation is normally, it's more stakeholder, right? Yeah. People are coming in with a specific stake that is a little bit different. So I'm also like a trained like focus group facilitator. Okay. So I've seen more um, overlap between the deliberation and focus groups than I do with mediation. Okay. Even though I think all three of them like share a lot of the same characteristics of how you facilitate them. Um, but yeah, I just feel as you're just trying to like, gather opinions yeah. more so, and that's why I see a lot of overlap between deliberation and um, focus groups. But then you're also trying to get to some sort of consensus, or at least share different perspectives, which then you get more of that mediation. Okay. So, yeah. Thoughts or questions about that one? We all like government. Yeah. <laughs> you create your own ideas as you are doing this, like uh, Ashley, she just finished, and then can she kind of like do a question again based on something that she, she saw that they, we didn't cover? Can she? Yeah, I mean, again, it, it becomes it's a finite distinction or gray area distinction between are you asking that question because this is an important issue to this topic we need to talk about, or something I think is important, right? You know, so you're trying to distinguish in a sense that you're, you're not asking that question because that's what you think, right? You're asking that question from a process perspective that this is an important part of the conversation that's missing, right? Uh, so that's where, and, 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 and those two, that distinction sometimes is not a distinction in some senses, right? 
Um, but you, you don't want your own opinion to come out too much, right? That you're pushing. So you don't want to say, like, no, I, I told several stories here. Like in my city, you would want to do that as a facilitator, right? Of kind of here's an example for me, yeah. unless it's the, the, the really the examples just to kind of help them think through something else. And, and, and right? Maria had to step out during it, but you know there are ways to other ways that that, that do not put your personal self to move the topic. Like you can point to the placemat, right, and say, are there other questions on your topics that you think are important? So that's kind of doing what you're saying, but maybe without putting your own or you biases. Or you know, we talked earlier when you were in here about the empty chair. We, we sometimes put an empty chair in the middle of the room and kind of tell people, if you want, you can bring someone to put in that chair, right, to bring it, or as a facilitator, you can, right? Um, you know, so, so like I was just kind of joking. We all kind of like government, right? So we didn't have a person here that's like, government bad, Texas bad, kind of, you know, so you could have brought that in, right? What would someone say here that, that feels government is already doing too much and taxes are too high, that we're relying too often on government to solve our problems? Or, um, you know, so that there's a lot of mechanisms of facilitator. If you feel a voice is missing, you don't want to fill that voice with your voice, right? that void with your voice, but there's ways you could do to kind of open the conversation up so that, that, that it gets filled in some way. So with this one, kind of do that, that same mechanism, what, what were some of the underlying values relevant to this topic? Again, we, we tend to explicitly talk about, right? But what are some of the things that we care about that were relevant to this topic? Health, health right? Yeah. So clearly health, both in terms of individual health. I mean, the, the framing of this as childhood obesity is important, right? Because it's that notion that children don't have as much power to make their own choices, right? Yeah. Uh, so, so it becomes a little bit more of a societal responsibility in a sense, in some ways. But then that goes directly into kind of another value of kind of valuing parents having control, right? You know, yeah. it, it, it seems to be violating something when we take when we tell parents how to parent, right? Yeah. So you know, the, the, the freedom, parental, I don't know, there's not really a phrase that we use, right? Parental freedom or parental kind of authority in a way. Yeah that we recognize, so that right there is this, this tension, right? Like, oh man, we, we, we feel we need to do something to help these kids, but then we don't all, we also don't want to <coughs> violate that parental authority or parental freedom. Or whatever. And so those are these two, what else? I think human like value or human worth, I think it came up in both approach one and approach two. In, term, talk a little in more terms of that, like right? the stigmatization and, and like a drug for like bullying, and that deals on your job. So that compassion yeah. might be part of that, right? Potentially, but Finally, yeah. that, that, one, one of my favorite probing questions is, tell me a little bit more about that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's a probing <laughs> question, right? <laughs> Someone says something, it's interesting, you know, but they seem to be, they, they finish talking, tell me a little bit more about that. This is a great probing question, right? <laughs> Keep talking, it probably sounds great. Uh, yeah, so that human value, that compassion, that uh, yeah, recognizing respects, that it's not know. just numbers, but that these are actual Real people individuals people. with value and worth and feelings, yeah. and that you need to respect and, and think about what sort of re how those regulations might impact that individual. Okay. Yeah, and going along with that, I think understanding education as a holistic process instead of you know a number on a test, right? So recognizing that there's a lot more that goes into educating the student. Yeah, so that, a lot of times when we do work on curriculum, that, that tension between the kind of a, the basics or STEM even right. and the whole child, right? right? I remember we did actually a big STEM project for the governor's office in 2007, way back when, um, and, and it was a lot of funding to kind of increase STEM, right? So then they they hired, they split up the state into six different districts and they hired someone in each district and they hired someone in my district from an education <coughs> I mean, in my college, uh, and then they asked me to help run the public process. And it was funny because they had kind of these designs um, of how to engage the public, and then I obviously tweaked mine a little bit. But the end of our design was supposed to be this: okay, now that you have this conversation, do you think we should expand STEM? And I said, that's a horrible question. Like, of course, like who's going to be against STEM, right? But the question we need to ask is: Are you in support of increasing STEM, even if that means we have to give up time for art or for PE or for those types of things? Because again, that's that's the question. If we're going to do more STEM, we're doing less of something else, or we're spending more time in class, or maybe we're combining things, right? Which kind of came up in a way, right? right. Um, but but there was, you know, but that's that notion that there's there is that tension between really getting good at the basics and getting better test scores. Right? Because we, we test science and math and English. We don't really test PE and nutrition <laughs> classes or civics. Civic education doesn't have a test, right? That, that's a controversy going on in Colorado in a sense of. Some civic teachers want there to be a test, right? 
Because if there's a test, then it becomes a more important subject, right? But then if there's a test, then they have to teach, you know, then there's a specific, you know, so you lose innovation oh, and flexibility. Like specific, like, right, like a standardized uh, test for civic education or for government, right? There's not one right now in Colorado. There might be in Texas, right? But, you know, there's interesting tensions in a way of, because if we have a test, then we have to measure it, right? Mm -hmm. And some things like, well, I don't, I don't know how to measure this, right? Um, but there does seem to be a bias in K-12 now that if you measure it, it's more important. Right. Yeah. So, would you have a test in social studies? Uh, not really. Not We have English, we have math, and we have science starts a little bit later. They're still so teaching there's no, the subject. So yeah. Not being yeah, there's just kind of standardized state. testing, right? Yeah. So, then there's this controversy because some teachers want the standardized testing because if there's standardized testing, important. more resources come with that. Yeah. But then other ones okay. saying, no, once we have standardized testing, then all of a sudden. Everything. Well, this is the other tension to think about. We'll, we'll get into this with clarity management more tomorrow, right? Um, testing means standardization, right? Which means consistency, which means everyone's doing the same thing. We, we, there's good stuff about that, right? right? But on the flip side of that is there's less innovation. Mm -hmm. There's less right. flexibility, right? Mm -hmm. you know? yeah. So in some ways, if every teacher is teaching it the same way across the state, Right? There's some good things about that, right? Sure. Uh, that means if you transition, you, know, you, you transfer from one school to another, well, you're kind of on the same thing. You've got the same textbook, and then, you know, then that also means that individual teachers, most teachers go into teaching not because you know, they want to control the classroom, right? You, know, you, you want to have control over your syllabus. You want to be able to have some flexibility, right? You know, so that consistency versus flexibility is a huge tension we deal with in K-12, right? That is often not discussed well, right? Because some people just see the advantages of consistency and the advantages of flexibility and, and don't see the, 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 the drawbacks of each. So that's something that we really push with our work with schools is to help them really think about that in a sense. Are there other values in here? So we have like health, we have kind of a like humanity and compassion, we have kind of education that's holistic, right? And then we have the flip side, which is education is rigor or education focused on the basics, you know. That, that you'll get, we didn't get much of that here, I kind of mentioned it briefly, but a lot of people say, hey, we're falling behind the world in you know, approach one from today, right, would go against spending time on nutrition, right? No, we need to spend time on math and science, and we need to kind of catch up to the world of math when you improve our test scores. And if they're outside running around, they're not doing it, right? Now, part of your response, which again is a good example of, no, that's a false tension, we need to transcend it. Because by running around, their minds are sharper and they're better. They're able to do better in class, right? They can count um, their jumping jacks. Yeah, that's <laughs> <laughs> your style, right? But it's, it's got to be home, right? No, we can't just kind of do hard, hard subjects all day long. They need to kind of have the education, you know, the, the, the exercise. That's a good example of identifying attention, but then also kind of rejecting that attention and saying, well, actually, they work together in some ways. I think also the core student death failures. It's also an important thing yep. here because, yep. well, you know, we are paying already enough taxes in this country. So yep. Yeah, it's very easy to come up with government programs, right? Yeah. With the recognition that, okay, if we're going to spend money on building public parks and those type of things, then we're, we're either increasing taxes or we're doing less of something. Right. How often do you, you know, have so people that's the who are willing to increase taxes almost on anything? Right. They never do. Right. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, yeah, equality is probably one of the equality and justice, right? The part of that came up, especially the folks one, right? That, that yeah, we want people to make better decisions. But it's a lot easier to make better decisions when you have money, right? Um, you know, it's pretty easy for me to, to, to feed my kids well because we have the resources for my wife to be home all day, right? So she can spend the time to kind of go shopping and make things, right? But if we're both working or if there's only one single parent, Going to McDonald's and getting the dollar menu would probably be something we do a lot more often in a sense, right? Um, so there, there's equity kind of justice issues kind of in, in, involved in this on, on, on how we're doing. Just the, the money and the time that good food takes in some ways, right? You know, so again, that's that same with this issue. We come up with all the list of things that we care about and then we start recognizing that there's some tensions between it. If we focus on this, then it, we're giving up on this, right? Or we're pushing back on that. So then we try to arrange the conversation, so that's what the conversation is, is how do we take on these tensions? Um, and how do we transcend them, or how do we kind of make the tough choice between them, or, or those type of things. Alright. We've got four. We've got a little bit more time here. 
I imagine they don't have to go all the way to exactly 4.30. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, tomorrow, we have some choices tomorrow, right? Yeah. Um, and, and the main choice, and, and, and I'll, I'll kind of set something up in the morning to kind of get it, but if I get a sense of it now, it'll help me, I can prepare some additional material um, tonight to, to have it ready for you. Um, well, so I was going to spend some more time on the morning going back to the cycle of deliberation, right? That was the deliberative issue analysis on the top, the convening, the facilitating, and the reporting, and the move down, right? Um, uh, we, we focused this afternoon on the facilitating, how do you actually kind of run these events, right? Um, I don't know between the other ones, if there's a particular interest, you know, we, we could talk about, you know, the, I have a couple pages that I gave you in my workbook about a uh, diverse audience and like that. That's more for community work. It seems like most of the people here are more about classroom work, right? Uh, so I think I'll focus more on that. So a couple different activities. Um, we One thing we could talk about, I, I'm assuming we will, because it's a good classroom thing, uh, of how to actually develop these frameworks, right? Issue framing process. Um, I actually, I don't have enough for everybody, but I had, I had quite a few left over the little white blue books over there that if you want, well, I'll pass them on to those. Uh, it's tethering material on how to develop these issue guides, right? Um, and, and I think it's online as well, too, so if you, if you can't get a hard copy, we can kind of give you the link. But I can spend some time on issue framing. Uh, 